Hello, I'm John Grant, and welcome to the next in a series of conversations, the Wardley Mac and Communities recording during the run-up to Map Camp, which will take place in London in October. Uh, before I introduce today's guest, I'm pleased to be joined again by Ben Mosier. Hello, Ben. Hello. Thanks, so, John. Ben, use your question. Anything noteworthy caught your attention? Yeah. Um, so, Jessica Kerr, who's Jesse Tron on, on Twitter, recently gave a really awesome keynote uh, at Velocity um, about and incorporated mapping and had a lot of interesting things. Uh, the title of the talk is From Puzzles to Products. And so I, I think that's a great thing to check out. And we'll, we'll throw a link in here. Uh, John, what, what have you found that's been super interesting lately? Well, it's, uh, it's a tweet that you put out today, which linked to some talks that you've done. Uh, one of the talks is agile is a disease, but so is, so is humanity. Um, <laughs> we'll link to that, but I would like to come back to that if we can later in the conversation when we bring in our guest. So All right. uh, a, big warm, a big warm welcome to Adam Buchengel. Welcome, Adam. Hello, nice to be here. Okay. I'm so glad you're here, honestly. I'm excited to talk about you and, and have you talk to us about what you're doing. <laughs> Me too. Great. I think this is a treat to get you on here. So let's start by introducing yourself and tell sure. us a bit about your background. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. I've been working in technology since 2007. Uh, before that, I studied computer science, and before that, I was really into uh, these things called cell phones, uh, which at the time uh, were just coming out, and I was sort of blown away by these little devices that I was convinced everyone would have carried around with them and there'd be at least one per person. Uh, and they were sort of the future interface to humanity. And uh, sort of followed that thread for a while until I started a company that was in 2007 in uh, sort of the intersection between communication and software distribution, if that makes any sense. The idea was that there was a sort of strange duality between messengers that we use and application distribution platforms. And every time there is a new one of one, we got a new one of the other. And maybe there is something here in terms of the future of computing. And we, if we built one system that was sort of a, a melange or a hybrid of both. Maybe we could just build on top of it instead of consistently replacing uh, one with the other. So worked on that for almost 10 years. Um, did a whole bunch of stuff. I'm sure we'll talk about some of that in the context of worldly mapping, but um, uh, that was sort of my real world education in all the things that, that, that happen in technology, raising money, building a team, building a product, all the things. Um, and so it was in that context that one of my good friends from school and coworkers, uh, first talked to me about this thing he was trying to wrap his brain about, which is worldly mapping. So. Uh, so that was your introduction. That was the prologue. Yes. The prologue. Okay. So how long have you been aware of worldly maps? Is it about 12 months? A few years, I'd say. A few years. years. Good. Yeah. Can you recall the aha moment? That you had with mapping or an aspect that suddenly clicked and you thought ah this is going to be a useful framework technique methodology yes quite clearly um yeah this friend and i we would meet up and we talk about all of the crazy interesting things that are going on in the world or in history that we had discovered and he made this comment about he kept meaning to study wordly maps and so I searched for it online and I found one of Simon's hour long versions of a hundred something slides he does. And uh, <laughs> it was, 
like I still remember sitting in my living room and, and watching it on, you know, Chromecast on my TV and sort of seeing this concept that like completely explained all of the frustrations and experiences that we had building this company for 10 years. And wow. The frustration that I had with so many, like I felt this in, intense uh, relief of tension that I had been feeling for many, many years because there's so much paradoxical advice and perspective in the world. And like there's evidence in support and against so much of it. Um, and when I saw this structured way of thinking, it, it just sat right in my brain and it suddenly relieved all of the paradoxical things people had been saying about, you know, you have to do things this way if you want to succeed. And I, suddenly it was like, you know, well, that guy's standing over there and that guy's standing over there and this person's here. So of course they're going to see things in their particular way. And so, if, you know, the, watching that was a mind, multiple mind blowing experiences in a, in a row, immediately rewatched it and then experienced more mind blowing experiences. Was that like a, a phenomenological kind of experience for you where you're just, you're feeling, you mentioned relief, right? Was that a physical feeling or was that just sort of like, oh, things finally clicked? What was that experience like for yeah, you? Yeah, it was a little, bit of, a little bit of both. Like, you know, you know, we often, I think, go through life with these, these premonitions about, you know, there's something going on here. I don't fully understand it. And then suddenly it like, it clicks. And you say, oh, that's exactly what was going on. I bet you if I do this, this will happen. I, you know, suddenly these two things, which I thought were, fighting against each other, they're not, you know, they're just uh, part of a larger symphony of, of things that are going on. And you can sort of hear and uh, see the music uh, that's, that's driving things. So yeah, it was, it was fantastic. And it really explained uh, a lot of the stuff that I saw, you know, our previous company was really embedded in, we, we did Y Combinator in 2007, you know, there's really deep in the startup community out here in San Francisco or the Bay, general Bay area. And there are a couple of mantras that exist in there, but everything else you knew, you know, talk to customers, work on product, uh, don't do anything else basically. And you realize that that's the advice you give um, one when you're in the, the space of the unknown, but also when you don't know what else, what other advice to give. Wow. Yeah. Adam, we've not met face to face before, but we no. have, we have, we do chat on Slack and there's something that you said the other day that resonated with me and uh, I think it was really interesting. So I, I hope you don't mind if I quote you on that. Just no, please. A couple of statements that you made. You said, I think the idea of helping people use mapping to help themselves and each other. I like the idea, you said. I misquoted you there, but. Um, yeah. You went on to say, I feel there's still a lot of opacity around that. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could unpack those statements and explain why you feel that way. Yeah, so one of the mental models I, I use when I navigate the world is this idea of potential energy. Um, and so just to sort of lay, lay that out, uh, to help with the unpacking this idea of uh, understanding the forces that exist in the environment and in the world, and then trying to understand how to uh, embrace what's actually going on. And so rather than, you know, there's this sort of idea that if you just think hard enough and work hard enough and get lucky enough, everything will just work. In reality, there's a bunch of things that are going on. And if you can tap into what's going on, much the way a dam taps into the energy of a river that's rushing to generate electricity, uh, there's a lot more opportunity there. And so what I see in mapping are a lot of brilliant people, a lot of motivated folks uh, applying mapping, but it's, it's very, it seems to be very isolated, you know, sort of like if, if we didn't really have a lot of teams building software and then somebody was saying, you know, what would happen if we could use multiple people to build programs? What would it be like if you could have a team of people building software? How much more interesting could software get? What if you could build websites that integrated between companies, between organizations? Uh, so this idea of 
bridging the work that multiple people are doing to some mutual benefit uh, and sort of take things to the next level. That's, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity that in the world, you know, driven by the internet, but especially in the mapping community. Does that help a little bit? It does. Um, well, I'll loop back to where uh, Ben's, uh, I don't best describe this as a kind of talk tutorial. Uh, and we'll link to it as well. Agile is a disease, but so is humanity. And in that, you talk, Ben talks about Taylorism, and he talks about Agile, and then how that fits, or how it moves into then Wardley. Now, I've noticed a kind of contradiction or a, an inconsistency with one of the principles of the Agile Manifesto that states, the most efficient and effective method to convey information um, between people in a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. Now the iSpace framework, which I know influenced both Wardley and Kenefin, talks about tacit knowledge and the fact that tacit knowledge flows very slowly through face-to-face -face situations. And it's actually, it's codified abstract knowledge uh, that can uh, diffuse rapidly throughout a population. So the opinion I'm starting to form is that Wardley mapping provides a bridge between the tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge. So it's an emerging soft skill that aids knowledge transfer. So my question is, do you see similarities in that? especially as I think as you've alluded to, where we're moving into a complex domain as default. But yes. Ben as well. Ben, do you want to field some of that? Happy to talk about it too. Yeah, there, there's, so the, the disclaimer is that that talk title is completely clickbait and, and really the intent there is to say that methodology is hard. Um, and maybe there, there are some interesting things we can do to think about how to better implement methodology. But the, the tacit knowledge, explicit knowledge kind of dichotomy is really interesting because the, the canonical kind of Wardlian response to that would be, well, Agile fits in this little space over here um, where, we, where we talk about things like, uh, like Genesis and custom and exploring. And so when you're exploring and you're, and you're kind of like wandering the wilderness trying to find value that you know is out there, and when things are going to fail a lot and you really, really expect the interpersonal dynamics to be unpredictable and, and or rather you expect the situation to be unpredictable. And so that has an effect on interpersonal dynamics. In that case, of course, face-to-face -face conversations are going to be better um, because when you're exploring stuff together and the only way you can talk to the other people in your, ex your party that you're exploring with is through JIRA or a ticketing system <laughs> at, you know, at the worst, the rate of communication and the probability of being misunderstood is exponentially increased because the actual things you're observing are not certain enough. So in that context, agile makes a lot of sense in the exploring space. Communication in that space involves a lot of weird stuff and it's hard to make weird stuff explicit. So let's talk about it instead and sort of do the, the messy human thing. But Mapping itself, if I like step away from like the, the canonical myth methodology conversation, there's this notion of like a map as a proposal of the way that we could view reality. And when we map, we are making that proposal. Um, like Jay Bloom has been having me think about like things like, what is it that we're doing in the world and, and what are we proposing towards and I think a map is like a, a way to pretend that for a moment we can make this tacit stuff explicit. And if we take that as, a, as an assumption of the engagement of the conversation, that's gonna result in a model. And we can disagree about the model. And even though it's not a perfect one-to-one -one mapping to the tacit knowledge, we can have a conversation around it and make some of that tacit knowledge either explicit or at least shared tacit knowledge. Like we can tell the story of the map share that story, but the story never becomes explicit. 
So I think that's a reasonable kind of way to, for that to come out about. And from, from the work that Adam's been doing, I think you've, you've really started pushing a lot of the edges of, of what you, know, you, you talk about as like an opaque kind of process. And what can we do if we could actually get together and harness our collective potential? But we haven't even managed to nail the basics yet of mapping. And we're a community of what, how many people do we have in there? More than 420 some? Like we haven't, we're all here. And just like your friend, like we, we all mean to have been studying mapping, but where, where is the sort of uh, the solid acknowledgement and understanding of the basics so that we can come together and work towards that? So I have a little bit of an opinion embedded in there. I'm kind of curious what Adam thinks about that. Um, how does this occur for you? Well, I think it was, uh, was that a talk from Gerald Sussman? So I, I agree with a lot of the things you're saying, but I was, I, as you were talking, this, this comment that uh, one of the creators of the structure, like a famous programming class at MIT was um, that if you actually look at the words that people exchange, the number of bits you need to represent the words exchanged by people is actually fairly small. And the fact that we can develop such a deep understanding in some cases uh, of each other based on just the, 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 like the small number of bits that are actually needed to represent the words being exchanged uh, is a testament to how alike people actually are. Like the fact that you can just ex exchange such such a small number of bits to allow you to get your idea across really says that we have a lot of shared infrastructure um, with the way that we process the world, but yeah. also even more so if you look at the people that can communicate quickly, whether it's on the trading floor, you know, in, in finance or on a sports field, we just had the women's world cup. Like you don't need that. The, the, the more your model of the world overlaps the more your vocabulary overlaps, the more quickly you can coordinate, the more nuanced some of the concepts you can, uh, get across are. And what I've seen is uh, notation and commu like communication tools, they're really actually, no, uh, they're like mental prosthetics. You know, we think about using a cane to walk, um, but we also use a notebook to think. And for the thoughts that are too big for one person to be able to think, that's where language and, and vocabulary and, and tools like mapping become absolutely critical. And so, uh, yeah, I really look at it as we have these sort of unformed ideas, like when they used to communicate about math without having algebraic notation. And now we have a notation to write it down and it's, you, we can go so much deeper. Um, and we now realize that math and notation are actually pretty inseparable as thinking tools. And so it turns out that strategy and business really is no different. Uh, but it's been quite hard to realize that that was one of the pieces that uh, that was missing. And so I, I very much agree with uh, the idea that, you know, the better our language for setting context, uh, the more productive and value driven, because I don't know if there were enough buzzwords in there before, uh, <laughs> but no, really, the, the, you know, the, the better our, our, mental models sync up, the better our vocabulary allows us to set context, the more meaning we can get across and you know, sort of uh, the, the better our exploratory tools, our execution tools, the more effective that we can be. Um, so yeah, I think, it's, I think it's huge. And I had the thought the other day that just like the hype that we see with certain things, whether it's the, you know, near the peak of the hype right now, we have things like blockchain and we have things like AI but also agile and over a slightly longer time scale. It's occurred to me that we're on our way there with mapping as well, that they're gonna people be, be folks. And it's sort of necessary as you know, it goes wider that it, it gets uh, reduced and simplified. So it's certainly gonna be interesting to see the same thing happen to all the things that we value so much that have happened to agile and you know, <laughs> these other techniques. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, well, this is starting to feel like a multi-part conversation. Um, I must be mindful to how much we can fit into a half an hour or an hour. And I think <laughs> I must move on to 
uh, map script because there's a sure. lot of about this. Yeah, I mean, this is this is Adam trying to scratch this itch, right? Th this problem. I, I really want to hear about this. So, John, what? Ask away. Oh, wait. What, what I'd like to hear, in your words, Adam, is how can you describe map script and the map script IDA? What is your motivation, and what needs are you trying to address? Sure. So, um, you know, the genesis of it, uh, I suppose, was, was really came down to a, a tweet. Uh, Simon was in the Bay Area and said, who wants to get dinner? So we went to dinner with a couple other folks. And uh, I have this tablet that we were drawing maps on. And it struck me in the conversation how much time and energy we were spending drawing a map so that we could get to the deeper idea. And, you know, we talked, I made uh, two comments to Simon at that, at that uh, dinner. Uh, one was, everyone talks about drawing the map. No one talks about what they do with it. Broadly speaking, it's always about uh, like, you know, this is how you draw the map, etc. And the convert, like the, the, the shouldn't say it was too broad, a bit too broad of a statement. Um, there's a lot of discussion about how to lay out the map and not a lot about the dynamics of the things that are on it. And you go one, two steps when you involve other, other folks. And I thought that one symptom of that was this other thing I realized, which is that if in order to play chess, you had to redraw the board every move for yourself from scratch, how many people would play, play chess and how good would anyone be at chess? Yeah. And of course, we have standard notations for describing games in chess. You can just buy the kit and you can lay out the board. And of course, there's a lot, you know, perhaps at one point chess was a more nuanced game and now it's much more standardized, but we still get pretty far talking about deep ideas using chess pieces. And so the question was, what would a chess board and chess pieces look like for mapping? Well, how can we get closer to a notation for uh, describing these things. And so map script was the first sort of attempt at saying like, can I come up with a chess notation for a map? That was like the original, original thing. And from there, you know, obvious things, how can I fit it into a link? How can I type it out so that I can send it to somebody else and they can interact with it and they can argue with it. Um, so that was really the starting, the starting thing I wanted to write about maps. Um, and I didn't have a way to, to write it down as fast as I could write down other things. So, so if I say that, that we can put the functional aspects for now to one side and talk about technical aspects. And this is really to try and engage people who are interested. So you sure. have to develop and prototype this. Um, you know, there's a lot to map script. You know, you, you, there's, a, there's a language that you do trying to develop, there's an interface, and there's a, a way of being able to codify maps as well. Can I say domain specific language? I mean, that's the one. Sure. That, yeah. So you've started on observable, um, which is good. It's open. I've had a play. Um, at this stage, what help or expertise are you looking for out there to, to come in? Yeah, so and contribute. Uh, yeah, so so I think it, I don't know how we're doing a lot of this verbally. You know, at some point I need to put out a some sort of tour of saying like these are all the pieces of map script. This is, this is how you do this, this is how you do how you do that. Yeah. Um, but to sort of give this high level tour of it and to dive into some of the specifics, there is a way to write down in text. A relationship between components and so this seems to work reasonably well um, and so the idea in map script is to go to, to, to shorten the time from you, you sort of want to lay out a comp some components and start to understand that layout and so what that means is really just laying out the value chain first so there's some basic syntax just for saying this needs this you know uh, T needs a cup a cup needs um, a dishwasher. Uh, so there's that aspect of it. 
Then there's the let's translate that simple definition into a, a reasonably laid out value chain. Um, and so just linking those two things together, I found observable to be the tool that allowed me to move extremely quickly. Um, let me experiment with different layout algorithms. Let me experiment with different syntaxes. Um, so to summarize, it, observable is a language to define a, a language or a structure or a, what was the one that you tweeted earlier? I can't remember, but it's also providing you with the infrastructure to render that. Yeah. Yeah. What I found is that, um, there's a lot of machinery. I want to be able to iterate very, very quickly without having to invent the tools for iterating quickly. Um, and observable by far is, you know, we talk, I think I made this comment to, to, to one of you that, uh, I think observable is like the serverless of development environments. Like you don't have to set up a gear repository. You don't have to set up your local tool chain. Like you type, you hit enter everything that is affected by the code you entered gets updated. So when you're trying to iterate on how to lay things out, how to draw things, multiple components related to each other, sorry, software components related to each other. I feel like if you don't start with observable, uh, you're, you're leaving some stuff on the table. And so that's why that's, that's, that's how that is. Now I know that I'm pushing observable really to the limit. It's not really made to be like defining these, these different libraries, you know, MapScript is probably composed of around 10 um, observable notebooks, one for the actual grammar of the language, one for laying things out, um, one for the, I haven't said very much about the runtime dynamics of map scripts, but it's possible to, to use it as a, a bit like a spreadsheet. Um, and then it's got other deeper concepts in it. Like you can do searches across components. You can search by attribute, you can search by relationship. Um, so there's the, all these things are broken up as their own observable notebooks so that they can be iter iterated on very Quickly. And for, for anybody who's not familiar with Observable, you're working with JavaScript, aren't you, to do this? Yes, yeah, so, sorry. Observable is a, a notebook environment, um, a bit like Jupyter Notebooks or IPython Notebooks, if you're familiar with those. Um, but unlike other notebook environments or Mathematica, uh, instead of it being, you know, first you execute cell one and then you execute cell two and then cell three, and if you change anything in cell one, you sort of have to manually re-execute all the ones after. Observable does all that automatically automatically re-executes cells based on the, the implied syntactic dependencies. Um, and it runs only locally in your web browser. So everything is running in JavaScript in your web browser. There's no backend component or server side anything. So was, we've talked about the definition language, yep. which is a kind of meta language. And then we've talked about the facility of being able to render maps, which is being the infrastructures there from observable. Now, just to give people a bit more of a taste of what you're doing, it's, you, this is what really interests me is being able to automate mapping or to build a kind of intelligence layer on top of it. And you've started to work on calculations of yep. flow. Is there anything that you can share or describe or? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I, I started using mapping in my own work. Um, essentially building a, a way to treat machine learning models as serverless functions. Um, they have different properties compared to other things uh, that, that we would normally think of as serverless functions in that there's multiple orders of magnitude, more machine learning models than functions. And so navigating this very rapidly developing uh, space raises lots of questions about um, like, well, existing serverless techniques don't actually uh, support machine learning models very well for a variety of reasons. So how do I make sure not to overinvest in things that, you know, AWS Lambda will eventually be able to do? How do I properly quote prices to the customers that want to use my platform? And what I found is that uh, spreadsheets don't really fit well in the world of mapping. And so I wanted to answer simple questions like if I know the components that, um, that my thing needs, uh, and I know the base unit costs of those components. Can I aggregate up recursively what the cost to deliver um, my component is? And then once you do that, you realize, well, I'd like to integrate overhead calculations. 
And so then you have, when you have overhead calculations like fixed costs and you have unit costs or variable costs, now you start asking questions like, where's my break even? What margin should I charge? What's my time, payback time? And you start getting into things that are relatively simple algebraic formulas to write out. But when you pile it on top of all these other things, it gets really hard to think about really quickly. Um, and so MathScript now has functionality to the experimental version of MathScript. If, if the language itself wasn't experimental, it has an experimental cousin. Um, the experimental version of it allows you to write equations that, that uh, will, will do things like find your break-even price or what margin is ideal. Um, I mean, I, there's, there's tons to talk about. How, how much have I covered the sort of things that you're, you're teasing at? Well, as I mentioned before, if this sounds like a part one of a series, a sub-series, um, if we could put a group of links together in the description, um, at least people have a starting point. Um, yeah. Let's take it from there. So I think I'll head towards winding this up. Um, here's a question for you, Adam. Is there anything that you've read, either a book or, or an article online or a, a film, TV, whatever, that's left quite a, a dent, that's had an influence on you, say, over the last five years? I'm looking at my bookshelf over here. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I heard, uh, I think, Ruben mention... Uh, thinking in systems. Yeah. Uh, that's absolutely, that's absolutely on there. Um, there's this book, Mindstorms, uh, by Seymour Papert, the guy who invented the logo programming language. Um, thinks a lot about the ideas associated with like, how do, how do people learn? How do kids learn? Especially when there's no curriculum. What does that mean? Yeah. If you wanted to create a micro world for thinking and for learning things, how do you do that? Um, and so that's what lo the logo programming language was designed to do. Um, so Mindstorms was his, uh, I think, most clarifying piece of writing. Um, he actually gave testimony at the... Uh, some congressional hearing from many years ago about investing in education. And I found that a lot of the same ideas, but to be pretty uh, moving. Um, Anti-fragile is also up there. Uh, it's another systems uh, piece that helps you understand really where, how to operate under uncertainty, how to thrive under uncertainty. Um, it's quite, was, a, quite a trio. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, but when I think about um, books that I like quickly buy for other people or recommend eagerly, there's one other one which I haven't heard folks talk about. It's in similar vein, which is this book called um, Notes. It has a really fancy sounding name. Notes on the Synthesis of Form. That's another uh, really good, uh, it's like a mathematician turned architect who started ask, trying to understand like the difference between traditional timeless systems of architecture and how uh, they're reconciled with um, the traditional way that we do architecture. And I think there's a lot of parallels to business, especially um, the idea of this is how we do things because this is how we've always do, do things is actually a very valuable, if you, if you roll that out over many generations, that's really valuable because it means the only times you go against tradition are when you have no choice and you must. There's no sense of ego about like, well, I'm going to do it differently for my reasons. And, and so you, you end up with structures and techniques um, that are driven by environmental forces and, and direct need, as opposed to traditional architecture, which really organizes systems of thinking based on how they can be taught which is a fascinating idea that we, you know, we teach acoustics one way, materials another way, uh, thermal properties of things another way. And it's really because that's how we specialize them. But, you know, the material you choose has properties across all of them. And so that, that was a, a mm -hmm. mind-blowing book as well. 
It's almost like the, the, the medium is the message. But yeah, similar. Very similar. Yep. Hmm. Wow. This has been awesome. Yes. I'm really glad you've been here. So you're going to map camp this year. So I am. Yep. If I want to start a conversation with you, you will be there. Um, yep. How else can people tune in? You, you, you're on Twitter. And do you have a yep. map? Yeah. Um, I'm in the map camp, camp Slack. Uh, I, you know, I'd love to have folks share their experiences where they feel like tools could have could have helped or they tried to use map script in a particular way um, or they're working on their own thing and and you know there's some ideas around helping two people work together on maps helping talk about moves on maps um, that you do different scenarios these kinds of things um, the inter in intersection of microeconomics and and accounting with with maps um, any of these I'm, I'm happy to to follow up with folks either online or at Matt camp. Great. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thanks, Ben. But a big thank you to you, Adam, for sharing so much today. Brilliant. Yeah, happy to have been here. Thanks for, thanks for making it happen.